Well, thank you all so much for joining us for an evening with best-selling authors Tess Gerritsen and Paul Dworin. Uh, best-selling author Tess Gerritsen will discuss her brand new book, The Spy Coast, and she's in conversation with another best-selling author, Paul Dworin. A retired CIA operative in small town Maine tackles the ghosts of her past in this fresh take on a spy thriller. A little bit about Tess, who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. A Rita Award and Nero Wolf Award winner, Tess Gerritsen has sold over 40 million books in 40 countries, racking up number one bestsellers abroad and top three bestsellers in the United States. Dubbed the Medical Suspense Queen by Publishers Weekly, her series features homicide, well, that was her old series, uh, features homicide detective J Jane Rizzoli and medical examiner Mara Isles inspired the TNT television series Rizzoli and Isles starring Angie Harmon and Sasha Alexander. Uh, Tess, I still, I still watch the reruns, Tess. Okay. And then pa Paul Warren is the best-selling author of the Mike Bowditch series of crime novels set in the Maine woods. And his work has received critical acclaim, receiving the Maine Literary Award twice, the New England Society's Book Award for Fiction, the Barry Award and the Strand Award, as well as nominations for the Edgar, the Anthony and the McCavity Awards. Uh, his latest book is Dead Man's Wake. Paul is the former chair of the Maine Humanities Council Editor Emeritus of Down East, the magazine of Maine, and he's a registered Maine guide specializing in fly fishing. How about that? Uh, so all uh, 275 of us or so who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Tess and Paul for being with us this evening. And Tess and Paul, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Who well, starts? Paul? <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Uh, thank you, Robert. I um, I was trying to remember when we first met Tess. It's been, it's an impossibly long pe pe period of time. People would not even really believe it. So I'm not even, I'm not going to put a number on it. Um, But, uh, and then I, I, because I knew you before you were writing uh while you were writing with for harlequin right right and okay. and i remember that i remember you know roughly the time that your life changed <laughs> way. it goes way back we we do go way back I, I i know you were editor of down east magazine at the time i believe so well, no we're, later, talking, but, yeah. we're talking decades we are talking we are talk, i know and it's just yeah nobody would believe it from looking at how youthful we are um but <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> but in all, age, have an age today. <laughs> no, all. But in all that time, I don't think we've ever done uh, an event together. Um, or if we have, I don't remember it. So this is really great. I'm I'm thrilled to to have a chance to talk to you, especially about the Spy Coast, which I got an early look at and and love for for a variety of reasons, sort of you know, writerly, readerly, and personal. Um, and I wanted so to. I yeah, good. Oh, I, I was just going to say, um, you know, for those who don't know this, Paul and I often walk the same road in the morning. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so, well, well, no, literally, we 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 will hike up the same road, and Paul usually has a pair of binoculars around his 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 neck because he is a big bird watcher, and and his lovely wife is a big bird watcher, and I don't know how many birds you can identify just by their song. Um, but this is an outdoorsman, and his books are uh, very much about the outdoors. And if you have not read a Paul Doran book, I really, really encourage you because I, you know, I've just finished uh, Dead Man's Wake, and it's fantastic. And what I love about us being on the same, um, you know, in the same panel is that we also are both, you know, we can talk about Maine, we can talk mm. about what it means to write about the place where we live. Yes, and I want, I definitely want to do that because. Um, uh, you literally write about the place that we live <laughs> in this book, which which I think is brilliant. Uh, that that you that you realize that there was such gold to be mined from from what I had actually thought was sort of this urban not urban rural exurban myth about the main mid coast, 
So you you talk a little bit about where the idea for the spy coast came from in the author's note, but I would I think probably people would would like to hear from you firsthand, sort of why this book. Well, yeah, well, so thirty three years ago, um, my husband and I moved to Maine, and um, you know we came to a little tiny town. You know, Camden is only five thousand people about, and uh, my husband opened up a medical practice because he's a doctor. So um, part of taking in new patients is finding out their occupational history. And he would ask them, what did you do for a living? Because most of them were retired. And he got this answer pretty, you know, more, more than once anyway. The answer was, I used to work for the government. And the question next was, well, what did you do for the government? And they would say, I can't talk about it. And after he heard this several times, he thought, where have we moved to? Who are these people? And why can't they talk about their jobs? So it was a real estate agent who told us, oh, they're all, they're all retired CIA. Um, and so that's where we first heard about it was from a realtor. Uh, and then I began, you know, checking around. I found out that on my very short street in Camden, where I was living at the time, there was a spy on the left of me and a spy on the right of me. They were both retired. One was OSS, one was CIA. And then um, my son had a good friend and I was on the phone with the son's father trying to arrange some kind of a sleepover for the boys. And something he said made me ask uh, or made me say jokingly, oh, you must be CIA. And there was a long pause. <laughs> There's a long <laughs> silence on the phone. And the man, his answer was, who have you been talking to? Okay, geez. That's when I thought, oh, I've wandered into another one. Um, so it turned out that he and his wife were both married. They were married spies during the Vietnam era. Um, and then just in the last couple of years, I mean, I think there was a period of about a month where I would go out to dinner, um, either at people's houses or would be join people at restaurants. And I found out in retrospect that every single one of those dinners, there was either a retired spy at the table or the retired spies um offspring at the table so that's that's you know it and it it really made me think why are they here what i do know they do? <laughs> and i don't know if you've ever had an answer but i mean the answers i've i've heard are okay well it used to be a place for safe houses maine that's where you'd go to hide oh another answer was well there are no nuclear targets nearby um and another was that you know mainers we're pretty good about minding our own business we don't pry and so it, it probably feels pretty comfortable to be in a in a place where people aren't all, all up in your business so that's <laughs> and so that that's the genesis but that was like three decades ago and i think the reason i'm writing it now is that mm. i'm older i'm old and <laughs> and, I, and I, I just thought about retirement you know what is it like to be retired from a very mm. interesting job um, and these people, especially who probably can't talk about it with everybody, what do they do? Do they have cocktail parties? Do they have book groups? You know, um, what is retirement like for somebody? Um, and do they ever feel the urge to go back? So that that was the genesis of the of the story. Well, I've I've confessed that I'm so um, frustrated with myself that I know this story too. I mean, I know I know the you know the rumor when it's not a rumor. Um, and I didn't see it as as a, a novel um, that and 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 so you 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 beat me to it and you're welcome to it. You've did a wonderful job sort of bringing it all together. And and my wife Kristen and I have the same sort of thing where we'll um, she's in in Rotary and there's of course lots of retirees in Rotary and somebody will you know will will be talking to somebody and he will have spent an a, inordinate amount of of years in Panama. And we'll afterwards say, oh, yeah, totally CIA. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, a, it's the worst kept no secret. <laughs> we all know it. And I think it just took me a while to figure out how to use it. Um, yes. And I think it was, again, it was it was age that went with it. Uh -huh. Now, a lot of these spies have, have died off. I mean, I think this was right. a thing big in the late 60s and early 70s and moving to Maine. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether there's still that that movement from uh, retirement up to Maine. Um, I don't know if you saw the letters to the editor, it was in the Courier Gazette or something recently. No. Uh, somebody was writing in response to my the story about my book. And <laughs> she said, um, the word is that the bottom of the barrel spies retired to Bethesda 
the middling spice retired to Florida and the cream of the crop came to Maine. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, hey, I'll, 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 that, that, I'm, I'll go with that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I had my, my brush with the CIA came a lot earlier in my life. I went to Yale and I majored in English and that was where the, the CIA rec started recruiting, you know, in the fifties was the Yale English department. Um, nobody came knocking nobody on, on my dorm room door. I think I would have made a pretty horrible spy, but, uh, um, uh, so this is, your book is kind of a change of pace for you a, a, a little bit. I mean, you've done all kinds of different things, so it's sort of hard to use that, that, that term, but, um, uh, were there things about, you know, I, I mean, I'd love to write a spy novel. Did you feel like, oh, this is, this is going to give me, you know, so many new opportunities to do some things I've wanted to do for a while or, um, no, you know, I, I think, um, I, it's true. I have, I have written, I haven't really shied away from too many topics. No. Um, I think I, I really wrote about it, not because of the espionage part of it, although, it, you know, that this, the tradecraft was fun to write about. Mm -hmm. I think I was looking at more of, um, that it was, it was more the emotional side of what is yeah. it like to be in a career where you can't tell the truth. Mm -hmm. What does that do to your relationships what does it do to your marriage i mean i i had one retiree say that this that the rate of divorce is sky high in the cia and i i can understand it and also what is it like to you know every time you make a friendship um that there may be a secondary motive involved it's not because you like this person it's because you want something from them or they want something from you so it's it just felt like a difficult difficult lifestyle what kind of a person goes into that um and so that that was what was interesting to me is is looking at the culture of spying. Um, and, and so the, the book is written, for those who haven't read it yet. The the book is written in sort of a couple of different ways. One is a first person narration by Maggie Bird, who is the protagonist, but really of the, of the story, who's the ex spy. Um, and then there's the the local police officer Joe Thibodeau. Um, who I think that will, you and I should talk a little bit about that too, because that's that's an area where we overlap. Um, and then some other sort of third person pieces. But um, yeah, n now that you're talking about the emotional part of it, it I was going to ask you why you chose to write the Maggie sections in the first person. And now I think I know, which is that was what was really driving you, right? I mean, right. It, it's her voice that came to me first. And a yeah, lot of times okay. my books, my books start with a voice and her voice. And the first thing I heard was her saying to me, I'm not the woman I used to be. Mm. And I could hear the sadness there. I could hear that there was something that she was haunting her. And I didn't know what she was talking about. Um, and a lot of times that's, you know, characters pull me forward. And so I thought, well, what, what kind of woman did you used to be? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? well, who were you and why, why are you telling me this? And so yeah. It all starts off with Maggie. You know, she's a she's a chicken farmer in Maine. She's a. I know. I love. I love that. I mean, this is the thing we you know, we'll definitely talk about Maine here soon. But um, the uh, yeah, I mean, even just the fact that what is it? What are they called? The aracata chickens. Aracatas, yeah. <laughs> with the blue egg. And for those of you, you, yeah, who don't know Mid Coast Maine, yeah, you, you you can't really go too far without tripping over somebody who probably has a <laughs> has a hen house with those in it. It's uh, the little details are perfect. So, uh. yeah. So, well, um, you know, I, I actually know a bit about chicken. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that helped. But um, so you know, here she is. She's just a chicken farmer. She doesn't talk about her past. Mm. Um, and then um, so nobody really knows who she is or what she used to do until a dead body, murdered body shows up on her driveway. And then that kind of that kind of launches her into the into the past because she realizes this is somehow connected to her past um, career. And she has to call for help because she's somebody's trying to kill her. And who does she call for help? But her four friends, uh, who all are all retired CIA, and she's known them for decades, so she trusts them. Um, but the fun thing, and you mentioned Joe Thibodeau, Joe Joe being short for Joanna. So let's be clear, she's a she's right. a young woman. Um, that conflict between the local Mainer and you and I know who these people are. You know, they're, they're multi-generational. They're solid people. They care about their towns and they want to protect their towns. 
but they're also a little suspicious of people from away. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this generational conflict between the young cop and the older spies and the locals and the people from away. Um, and there, I think that that tension really is what was what was made it fun to write because I mean, I'm from away. I've been in Maine for 33 years, but I'm still from away. And Paul, are you, are you a multi-generational Mainer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I figured with the name. Stanford area originally. They came with down the from Canada to, you know, make shoes and things back when there was no work up there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that so you know the tension. Um, oh, absolutely. That, it's it's yeah. it, it, and I think that's one of the things that the book captures really well. And I'm I'm gonna I was really glad that you included Joe for two reasons. One is, um, you know, it adds the verisimilitude to a spy story that you know otherwise can be. I mean, we love spy stories because they're not typically that. Uh, they they're free. They they take they take uh, you know their departure from from reality for the most part um but um but just the fact I, I like the fact that hey a dead body you know in mid-coast maine and it would be sort of horrendous in my view if the local cops were not involved in the story <laughs> in a significant way um you know just because uh i think there's the it it did it it is a way of of highlighting this clash of cultures um because that extends i think beyond for instance your story which is that you have other characters who aren't necessarily spies i mean his uh maggie's neighbor luther right mm -hmm. is also from away and and it's just this phenomenon that we have in the, on i think the main coast in general not mid just mid coast but all the coast where people retire they wash up here with these really interesting complex backgrounds and some of them are very happy like these spies to sort of vanish into the woodwork and others you know immediately run for select board <laughs> because they, they've recognized everything that this little that your little town that they've just moved into that they know nothing about should be doing and, and should be doing much better right and, right it's you know it, it's a, it is a very weird uh it, it can be very weird sometimes to to be here and you know to be in the, the same rooms with people who are you know who are ex -C ceos and um you know big wigs at cbs and, and this sort of thing and they're yeah and then you know there's somebody who's a third generation lobsterman you know and it's it, it, yeah to talk about uh culture uh well, sure. that that's one thing I loved from the very first time we moved here is that my kids went to school with all their kids and they because we don't really have a tradition of private schools in Maine. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The really rich and, 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 and then the poor farmer, their kids are all going to go to the same classes. So, you know, we really do get, get to mix. Um, and I think the other thing that's really wonderful, especially about the mid coast, because we have such an interesting, maybe 50% of people in the mid coast are actually from away. I would um, except we have the Camden conference. We have, mm -hmm. which you know, a little town, how do they have a conference every year in the winter time, the, the worst time of the year. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they bring in experts in foreign affairs from around the world and they come and they talk. And I'm standing in our, our you know, I'm sitting in our Camden opera house and listening to these questions that my neighbors are asking and their questions are so educated and so because clearly, they're all like spies i think they got it when i hear <laughs> that i think oh my god this is another ex-spy so uh, so there's there's a richness that comes from uh, attracting this kind of talent from around the world um but then it's it feels like the people like joe thibodeau keep us grounded yeah. they make us remind they remind us of you know what it's like to be from this stony soil yeah, well, my and my wife Kristen is a is essentially a Camden native, and uh, which you know we I, we often joke about is the rarity <laughs> in, in this town to actually meet somebody, you know. But but you know the police chief is somebody she went to school with, and and you know there are just so many people in the community who are who have who you know have been here forever for generations, and and yeah, do ground. Um, I think. Quite honestly, I think that they keep the place livable because <laughs> I hate to think what it would feel like if it was just all all people from from out of state. Um, 
Um, although, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, it, obviously people, uh, are coming in, bringing all kinds of talent. And, and as you were saying, you go to the Camden conference and you hear your neighbors standing up and asking these questions uh, <laughs> about just really, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's like being in the best, you know, graduate seminar that you can possibly imagine I, on a different subject every year. Yeah, it's like you're you're sitting in at Georgetown University in a in a yeah advanced history yeah. class or something. So I mean, what I love, okay, now we should talk a little bit about about the fact that your books are really grounded in Maine, and you have a lot of real Maine characters, um, not to mention a lot of outdoors, <laughs> out outdoors scenes that um, take in just about every kind of a job that somebody who works in you know in the warden service would have to deal with. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it and, and but it's it's interesting that's that culture clash that you mentioned, you know, but say between Maggie and Joe, that's often a feature of my books too. So the book, the yeah, that that Robert mentioned, Dead Man's Wake, takes place on um Great Pond in the Belgrade Lakes area of Maine, which was the basis, the inspiration for Golden Pond for mm -hmm. the play on Golden Pond and and then the movie um which was actually filmed in New Hampshire, because yes. Maine, has a law, Maine has a law that you you can't film a, a book set in Maine here or something. It, it's everything everything ever that's ever set in Maine is filmed somewhere else, evidently. Um, but in any case, yeah, the uh, you know Great Pond is a place where um, they're very you know it, it's some very wealthy people own own lake houses and. Um, I think they're gone. So I think I can say that they did. Um, David E. Kelly and, and Michelle Pfeiffer had a place there. Um, Elizabeth Arden was the original settler, a uh, fancy settler of, of the Belgrade Lakes area. And of course, you know, it's, um, there are plenty of people who are just from central Maine and they, <laughs> you know, yeah, they, they, I can't talk about all the famous people on the mid coast because it was the list <laughs> was too long. Yeah, but. It's, it's true. It's true. Wait, but, so you know, yeah. yeah, but you know, it's it 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 is it ends up becoming a, a sort of a function of all of my books, whether I intend it to be or not. You know, as soon as you you want to have a character maybe who is a professional, it's mm -hmm. very unusual that this person has sort of hasn't come here from somewhere else. Yeah, and so yeah. um, uh, it, it 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 immediately. But I think again, I think it motivates conflict, or you know, it motivates um the sort of challenge to understand each other when you have to work together mm -hmm. uh, and it makes for great fiction and it makes for great fiction absolutely yeah. does yeah, yeah. Um, so it's um so so anyway my my book is is not just set in maine though i would say yes. probably a third of it is set abroad um and when we go into maggie's history because there is there is some flashback about how she ends up and what what brought her to maine is really pretty much her last operation just about mm -hmm. broke yeah. Um, and so she's trying to forget all this stuff, everything that happened. And um, it was fun for me to go back in some of these these exotic places that I've been, like Istanbul and, yeah. and Bangkok. And, um, did you and, did you go back? Did you use the excuse of the book to go back yet again? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I, I probably should have. But these are places that I, I've been to and loved. Yeah. And um, it was fun to be able to use sensory memory for some of these locations. I mean, for me, when I think about a foreign country, I, I think about the smells and the food. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of food in this book as you, people who, who will, will read it will find out. And partly because my father was a professional chef. So food is, is big for me and it's big for Maggie too. And it's yeah. big for the it's big for the Martini Club. Martini Club, yes, as these as her group of of uh, ex spies are sort of name themselves in the book. Um yeah, I uh, I often sort of think about the fact that I chose, you know, to write about uh, a main game warden, and then ended up this ended up becoming a series, which ended up basically becoming my life. And so my idea of like foreign research, you know, is 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 you know going up to Millinocket. <laughs> I don't. I haven't. I haven't found ways to sort of to 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 justify. Well, you you did a, you did Florida and Python. I did. Well. I did have. I did. I did manage to, to to work in a few chapters set in Florida. So I just have to be more ambitious yeah. about this. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, the international spy um, 
is uh, that I, I think, I mean, it's great. It, it, it's such a wonderful element of the book is that, you know, we do, we're in Istanbul and London and, and uh, Bangkok and, and, and these other places. And I think it does, I mean, because that's the other piece about living in mid coast Maine is because you have these people here who had very rich lives elsewhere, they are stay connected to the rest of the world. So it does not feel like we are living in a corner of, you know, reality by any means. I mean, because we're surrounded by people who have traveled and lived, you know, full lives and are still doing that. And um, because I think it's, you know, it is this obviously the stereotype, right, about Maine is that it's a place that sort of, you know, lots of people like will will make their attempt at the accent, you know, as a, as a joke. It, um, yeah, it feels safe. It Maine felt yeah. safe at least until Lewiston. Um, I think yeah. that that shook us all up quite a bit. Um, and but you know, one thing you realize as you watch the world kind of go crazy around us right at this moment is that there are no safe places left in the world. Um, and I think that's what my my five spies really are very aware of. Um, I think towards the end, they even mentioned that if there's a war in South Asia, um, if there's a nuclear blast in Washington, D.C., it all washes up even to me. Um, so so I think that that's that was the other thing I was I was trying to get into was the idea of, you know, these are these are patriotic people. They 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 did their jobs because they were serving their country, but they're also very aware that crisis and conflict it's constant, um, that it has to be watched. You have, there has to be some, somebody like keeping their eye on the ball at all times, um, because we're all connected. We don't always think we are, but, but you know, whatever is happening um, right now in, in Gaza, it's going to be affecting somebody in Maine as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, and I think that, that, that is a really important, um, point to make and, and, and 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 I'm glad that you brought that forward in, in terms of, of of the book because I can see, you know, um, how it helped motivate the writing of it, uh, and uh, you know how unfortunately, um, when when the mass shootings happened in Lewiston, you know there was I think this is it, you know th this is how we we're living now is that yeah Americans are discovering other parts of the country by these shootings right it's like you know i yeah. didn't know nothing about uvalde texas until that happened you until know? uvalde it happened right yeah and you know and i'm sure this it, i'm positive that the same thing happened with lewiston um yeah. it's nobody knew anything about lewiston maine before that um and it's, just, very, it's a very sad way to to yeah to be you just informed. keep your fingers. You keep your fingers crossed that that the world doesn't doesn't hear your town's name for <laughs> one reason or another, unless it's somebody got you know gotten into the astronaut program or something. But um, yeah, you you want you want to keep your town safe and hidden, and um, and then nowadays we can't. No, we can't. We can't do that. Yeah. So what was it like though? I, you know, I I have um, I have set a few scenes in my books in Camden, Maine. Um, but not really tried to sort of tackle the culture of of this specific stretch of the mid coast. How did you feel about doing that? Was that a lot of fun? Well, I changed the name. To yeah. I mean, people know what town it is, but I, I made the town a name the name Purity because I like the innocence of that name. I yeah. mean, it feels it feels again, like I said, a safe place. Um, but when I've done signings or done little, you know, talks in the mid coast, there's always this wink, wink from the audience. They all, they all nod their heads. They all know what I'm talking <laughs> about. And, and then they'll come up and they'll tell me their own CIA stories um, if they know them. I mean, yeah. I, one guy came up to me and he goes, "Yeah," he said, "There was a CIA, per, a retired CIA person in uh, in my health club or in, at the YMCA, and we all knew about it because he got Alzheimer's and he wouldn't stop talking about it." <laughs> so, so yeah, everybody has has a story, and you know, you and I probably um, we know some of the inside lore about. Um, no, I think you might have been editor of Down East um, mm -hmm. when there was an article written about the MK Ultra um, connection to Mid Coast Maine, or maybe that happened before you. No, were that was that. Yeah, that was not me, but um, but 
I was just going to say about you know making up a name for for a temp. Somebody asked me. I I did an event the other night, and somebody asked me, "Well, when do you know you you know?" So it seems like you set your books. Some of them are set in places are real places, and some of them you fictionalize the names. Why when do why do you fictionalize some and not others? And I always say that I will fictionalize the name of a of a place and certainly a business if I am potentially going to be sued. I don't think the CIA is going to sue you. No, they, they'd, be, they'd be suing a lot of movie companies first, I think. Yeah, but I think they would be. Yeah. So yeah. You, you told me that um, um, before we, we went live here that uh, for people who who are fans of the book, and I, I looked at your Amazon um, uh, reviews and ratings and things, and it looks like people really are embracing this. Which is must mm -hmm. be fun for you. you they know. are, yeah. Um. So I was, yeah, I was surprised to get so, especially. I mean, I got wonderful reviews from Associated Press and from Kirkus and from Booklist. Um, you know, when I wrote this book, and it, it, this is true for all of us who write, who write like a first, a, a first in a series. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. It's like sending your baby out, as we all know, and you have no idea whether people are going to like it or not. Um, and this one, I think, was. It was just it was just one of those books where I was going to throw it out there and see what people thought and uh, expect you always expect the worst. I think that writers yeah. maybe by maybe by, you know, by my own personality, I'm a little bit I'm 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 a little bit pessimistic about how the audience reacts to books, because I mean, we've all had well, maybe you have it, but. I've had my <laughs> bad reviews over uh, over the the thirty plus. Oh books no, never. <laughs> I mean, and, and every every single one makes me think that maybe I I should just get out of this business because obviously <laughs> this one reader you know who thought the book was horrible must be right. Um, yeah. So there was there was that there was that um, tension, um, but I think it really helped that when Amazon made the offer, mm. they liked it so much it came with a television deal. Um, that original, uh, you know, Amazon Studios immediately said, we, we think this belongs in a, as a TV series. Um, so that helped. I thought, okay, well, even if everybody hates the book, it'll be a television series. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and of course, that's one of the questions that people inevitably have about, about novels these days is, you know, is it going to be made for TV, you know, or is it, is it going to be net, net stream, net, Netflix or or Amazon Prime or HBO or whatever it is. And so you, the, the question is answered. Uh, you know, it, it depends on whether they follow through with development, which is the- Right, the which, thing is, which is tough. It, I mean, it's tough. If they, if, I don't know how many books are optioned and probably 90% of them never see the light of day as a television series or um, or anything else. So um, I think this, the strong interest helped. Um, and I was just in Amazon Studios last week uh, meeting with the team and um, very optimistic. They're already talking about talent. So uh, let's, let's hope. Good. I mean, this is, this is also a really good opportunity for older actors because once, once you hit 60, how many roles are there for you? And here are five good roles for people over 60. Uh, yeah. I, that's, I, I was thinking that as well, you know, it, it, seeing something I was, I, I, Kristen and I watch um, only murders in the building and you know, it, here's you know here's um, Steve Martin and Meryl um, Meryl Streep and Martin oh, Short. Sure, and, yeah. uh, you know, and and you know you think to yourself, well, they had to make an opportunity. Steve Martin and Martin Short had to make an opportunity for themselves, basically. They had to create back it. on screen. Yeah, you know, because because the opportunities for older actors, you know, for good roles are fewer and far between. But you have su the supporting cast, I think, in this. Um, in this first book, at least, you know, and I'm sure you do more with it in subsequent books. Um, Younger does, people. Yeah, it does get yeah. great roles, so. I think it's unfortunate that that is, uh, that is what we see on American television is just everybody's young. Um, yeah. And now, but now executives are noticing, oh my, The Golden Bachelor is doing really well. I just mm. saw that it has 11 million viewers. So there, there is a hunger to see older faces, experienced faces, um, like there is on British television. I think there's a lot more there. Um, and that was the other thing I was addressing in this story was how, as we get older, we disappear. Um, yeah. I think in particular women do, we sure. disappear. Nobody pays attention to us anymore. They don't, they don't ask us what we used to do. They just want to, they just want to know what, what can you do for me? Mm -hmm. um, and 
I think it's Maggie that says this in the book that the best the, the best disguise is gray hair, but nobody will <laughs> buy. <laughs> so I know yeah, that really the, the best buy is probably the person over 60. Um, and I, you know, I, because I am now in that age group, I certainly experience it. And I think that's one of the reasons why this book felt, you know, pretty personal to me. Um, but yeah. I, I just want people who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s to know that there's always another adventure ahead. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a I'm a Le Carre fan. And, um, and, you know, George Smiley is sort of, he w- routinely described George Smiley as being somebody you would just look past you know he's he has maybe owlish glasses and things but he's just completely unexceptional and and that's you know that's it's probably why he's such a good one of the reasons why he's such a good spot and then smiley himself talks about meeting his nemesis carla the head of the ends up becoming the head of the kgb and he can't remember what carla looked like yeah and, good time <laughs> so, so, so maybe that you know maybe it's not, maybe that's also a, a quality of of good spies is is that they're just sort of they 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 don't impress you with the strength of their personality or right. their their good looks. They're not James they're, Bond. They're, they're not, not James, James Bond. Bond. No, and no. and that was the other thing is you know I'm I did not want to do a James Bond book. I don't want people running around with guns. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was really much more interested in. I guess the art of intelligence gathering that has yep. nothing to do with weapons and everything to do with relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that way, it's not it's not your typical spy book. Um, but then James Bond is not your typical spy. So <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, yeah, you, the, that uh, that's he he definitely represents false advertising for the career a career in espionage. I, I think <laughs> I wonder how many people were lured into to joining, um, you know, MI6 or, or whatever, because they thought they were going to have this glamorous jet setting career. Speaking of jet setting careers, however, I just wanted to say, if one was going to be a spy, a very good cover story would be um, a best-selling author of many books who travels the world and sells 40 million copies. <laughs> okay, Paul, now I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it's like, I, yeah, I met you when you moved to Maine. It's like, but what did she do before she moved to Maine? Now I'm wondering, you know, you know, you know I don't know about you, but I would make a terrible spy. I would be <laughs> awful, awful. Um, because it would be it would be really hard for me to maintain uh, that kind of a facade. Um, yeah. But you're right. I think, I think journalists um, and I, I know that most journalists don't. You know, it's it's like verboten to be a spy and also be a journalist because you don't want to put journalists in, in danger, um, just as you don't want um, uh, any kind of a who person who works for, for international aid, they're not supposed to be spies either because you don't want to put them in danger. Right. Um, but that aside, I think it would be, I, I'm psychologically not not fit to be one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was never, I was never fit for that. Um, fortunately, we found that we had other skills that we, we could <laughs> make use of. <laughs> I Right. So um, anyway, I should mention that this book is the first in a proposed yes. series. I'm working on the second book now. It's called The Summer Guests, and it's set only in Maine. Um, and it has to do with, there's a little history of CIA involved in it, but um, it's about um, summer people, as you, we all were talking about earlier, and one of their daughters, one a teenage girl, goes missing. And so the main warden service is called in to uh, oh, search wow. the pond that's there by the house. <laughs> and instead of finding the missing girl, they find a skeleton that's been there for decades. So oh, oh, man. Um, you, you already got me. So there is, I mean, there is some CIA. <laughs> you had me at main warden service. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but again, Joe Thibodeau is involved. And so is uh, my five martini club members. That's that's great. The, so the idea of the closed series, was that a way of, of you, was that a discipline did it help you with sort of some you know having some kind of artistic control being able to step back and see it whole um and not not think to yourself okay this is now what i'm doing instead of rizzoli and isles or 
or and certainly your fans your Rizzoli fans would be like oh no stop we need I know to- I know that's that's, that's <laughs> all I get are you writing another Rizzoli and Isles book um yeah. it's it's and this is what ha- this is how the Rizzoli and Isles series got started is that you fall in love with your characters mm-hmm. um you know after I spent a book with them I thought I I don't want to see you go I want to find out what happens next and uh, you know what when what do these five retirees ever ever get to trust Joe and Joe does Joe ever trust them and and what's the next thing that's going to happen in this little town of purity mm-hmm. um so that's how series start is your characters won't let you go well that's how my series started you know I I um thought I was writing a standalone, you know, and it was going to be my one and only book. And then it ended up selling as the first of a, of, yeah. of three. And the problem that I had was this guy was a, he's, he was a rookie main game warden who was 24 years old. And even by the standards of, of messed up law enforcement officers, this guy was very, was very dysfunctional. And I was like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to make a series out of him? And the answer came from, well, I'm going to, I'm going to have him grow up because Mm -hmm. that I'm going to take the disadvantage of him being 24 and try to turn it into the opportunity of having a series that shows a character who evolves um, from a pretty callow person in his youth to, you know, somebody who's hopefully more admirable and, and heroic, you know, conventionally heroic, I guess I would say. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in the brought, of yeah, but plus you brought in a whole universe of characters. Right. I, you know, now that's, it's, um, I don't like series where the hero never changes. They no, just I mean, stay the same. I mean, it feels, uh, um, it just feels so static. And yeah, I, things happen around him, but they, but it doesn't affect them personally. Um, now it, it affects Mike Bowditch, should have, um, and with Rizzoli and Isles, that was never meant to be a series either. But again, you see that evolution. And you also see as the series goes on and with your books as well, more and more people that were in the periphery start to come in and become a part of the central story. There's a whole new, new universe. Um, and I think that's how you sustain a series. It's not, it's not easy to keep it going beyond 10 books. No, no. And I, th- I think, you know, anybody who, who does this for a living as we do, you become, when you read a series being written by the authors, you know, it's it's pretty easy to tell when that author is really is, is reaching the end of their th- their tether with those characters. It's just like you can just the exhaustion is just sort of coming through the page. Um, right, and I think you and I both know why Conan Doyle killed Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He was tired. <laughs> I mean, the funny thing is, is that before I started writing, you know, a novel, let alone a series, the I would have been one of those outraged readers who just you know would have been shaking my my walking stick or whatever and saying how could you do this you know you can't kill Holmes and now being on the other side of this I'm like of course I know what he did (laughs) (laughs) and to 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 those you know of of my readers who are tuning into this don't be afraid I, I have no plans to 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 kill Mike anytime soon he's yeah. for one thing he's still young he's only 33 it, uh, well, there's always a bullet <laughs> yeah. there's always a bullet. <laughs> it's true he's the fact that he's not dead yet is is actually a miracle in and of itself so um yeah. but, and, and Jada and Mora are still alive um and I have I have not put an end to this series in fact I had an idea for the for number 14 and if Maggie Bird hadn't taken over my brain so oh wow okay so yeah. I've actually, so my series now is longer than the Rizzoli and Isle series. I cannot believe that. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you write faster than I do. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. I can't believe that that's true, but you've been, you've been at it for a while too and, and done some other things, um, including, you know, screenwriting and, and um, uh, adaptation work. And I mean, having your books adapted, which has its own, I I heard you talk about how much work it is just to sort of, um, be adapted. Well, I guess I shouldn't say work, but it's 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 preoccupying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I see that Robert's is Robert is back on the screen and he's trying to crack the whip on us. So, <laughs> Robert, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, great conversation, Paul and Tess, and uh, let's take about fifteen minutes of audience questions. And we already have about fifteen questions or so. 
I think I'm going to focus uh, to start here on uh, the writing process. And uh, an anonymous attendee says, uh, Tess, I heard you say once in an interview that you write your first drafts of your books in longhand. Do you still do that and why? I still do that. And the reason, um, well, I've tried to write on a computer and I end up editing the paragraph, the same paragraph to death. So what I've learned is that um, that if I write with a pen and paper, I don't I don't stop to edit. It's, for me, it's really important to keep that forward motion going until I finish the first draft. Um, I also am peculiar in that I write, it has to be unlined typing paper. If, if it's got lines on it, I feel that it's constraining. Um, and I wish I could change my technique, but I don't, I, I just can't. Um, I think that at a certain point, you just, you just accept your own process. Uh, next question is for both of you. An anonymous attendee asks, what is the best piece of writing advice you've received that you still use in your own writing? Paul, why don't you start that? Yeah, I will. Um, it, it embarrasses me to to admit that I don't know who it was who said this to me. <laughs> but it, it, somebody was telling me that essentially the secret to to having a career as a writing is is persevering is just you just keep doing it um that all of us meet somebody who say oh i'd love to write a book someday and then you meet somebody who said who started a book started writing a book and didn't get very far and lots of people you know stop in the middle very few make it to the end and um and then even fewer do all of the kinds of, of things that you really need to do to have a successful book, which is that you need to give it to critical readers who are going to tell you what's wrong with it. And you need to listen to them. Um, you need to know who to listen to. And you need to uh, you know, put your ego aside and just keep working and keep working on it until you have something that you know really other people want to read they desperately want to read you know and that but it, it is it's work and it's just you know it's keeping your nose down a lot of days and just moving forward as Tess was saying well the other half of perseverance for me is that I don't stop to edit I just keep on writing to the end I allow myself to write badly the first draft because the first draft is horrible okay just accept it you know mm -hmm. that's why it's called a first draft or somebody told me that that's they call that that their puke draft <laughs> um, so so it, once you finish your first draft, that's when I know what the story's about. It's like, I have to get through that first. So um, as Paul said, there are a lot of people who write halfway through, they get discouraged and they throw it in the closet and then they start another book. So they have like 50 first, you know, first drafts halfway done. They never finish it. Um, I just say, finish it no matter how awful it is, um, because once it's done, then you'll know how to go back and fix it. Absolutely true. Uh, so we have a question from Karen, and we have a couple of similar questions, but I'll ask Karen's. Uh, she says, Tess and Paul, what books do you read for pleasure, assuming you have time to actually read for pleasure, and what did you uh, last read, or what are you reading now? Oh, okay. Well, you know, usually for pleasure, I will read a lot of nonfiction, because I, I love nonfiction. I love books about science and about history. And um, but the most recent book I read was actually, and Paul, you'll you'll find this interesting. It's it's a manuscript uh, by someone who I don't even think has an agent yet. It's called The Battle of Owl's Head, and it's about <laughs> World War II and U-boats that were threatening the main coast. And the main and half the story is told from the point of view of a giant dog. So <laughs> when, when, when it comes out, I'll let you know. Because <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, the, well, I, I actually read a lot of nonfiction, too. And the reason I, I read nonfiction is that I, um, in addition to loving it, it's it's that I have a hard time uh, reading fiction while I'm writing a novel, because if the fiction is bad, I will I, I I can't get into the book. I'll begin thinking about my book and how I would be, you know, doing this differently. And if it's really good, I have found sometimes that I will sit down at the computer and my writing will become similar to whatever it is that I'm reading. And for instance, over the summer, for some reason, I hadn't read Faulkner since college. 
I was reading all this Faulkner and my sentences got longer and longer and longer. <laughs> but the book actually I just I just finished last night was um Robert Galbraith uh, with JK Rowling um her her latest book The Running Grave and it's about a, a cult uh in in Great Britain and I, I enjoy those books quite a lot actually. Uh, follow up question from from Carol uh, for both of you. Is there a writer who has influenced you in your childhood? Oh, okay. Well, that that's easy because I think I have the same answer that um, pretty much every woman mystery writer in America of a certain age will have give you, and that's Nancy Drew. <laughs> that was, you know, that was those were my very first ones, and then um, as I got into teen, it's teens, it's 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 Tolkien. Um, so it's, it's it's you know it's boring because everybody says it has the same answer. <laughs> Well, yeah, same answer, Tolkien for me. Um, I, I, although I was a Hardy Boys reader. Um, okay, that's the flip side of it, <laughs> Nancy Drew. <laughs> um, uh, but the but the thing about Tolkien that I found, you know, do, he, he was obviously writing something very different from what I write, except for the fact that I've realized that my impulse to do this sort of world building in the series, where I've introduced all of these characters and people come and go. Uh, has probably has its roots in having read fantasy when I was young, which is that I like I like the secondary characters and I sort of want to know what happens to them too. And I don't want them to go away, you know? I, so it, yeah, I mean, I think the stuff that we read when we're young obviously has a long effect. Uh, and last question about other authors, and then we'll start focusing on you two and your works. Uh, and you probably get this question a lot, being that you're from Maine, uh, but Lorna would like to know, uh, have either of you ever hung out with Stephen King? I know. I, I, I will say no. So I will turn it over to the person who who can say yes. I played once with the Rock Bottom Remainders. Um, I, played my, <laughs> I played my fiddle. I didn't know what to do with a fiddle in a rock band, but I, you know, it was fun. <laughs> I, I'll just say that Stephen King is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. I mean, you can sit and talk to him and he'll he'll be using half his brain to converse with you, but the other half is still writing. <laughs> <laughs> I would believe that. He, and the other thing that people maybe who, who are not outside, who, who, who are living outside of Maine don't know is he and his wife, Tabitha, have been just the most wonderful philanthropists for the state of Maine. I mean, they've given so much money to so many great causes. It's it's they've done a lot. He's given a lot back. So Tess, circling back to uh, how the conversation with when you with you and Paul started, uh, Kathy would like to know how did your CIA neighbors actually feel about you writing this book? I think they're amused. <laughs> um, they haven't actually said anything to me. I know that their 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 children are very are, are very curious and amused as well. So I I don't know. They haven't told me. Uh, Elizabeth would like to know, how would you compare Spy Coast to Richard Osmond's The Thursday Murder Club series? Are you familiar with that series, Tess? You know, I, I just started reading the very first um, uh, Osmond book, and it is funny. It is, I mean, I think that probably Osmond is, he's a much funnier person than I am. Um, and he uses uh, a, characters from a variety of occupations um, who are solving their mysteries. Um, I suppose that mine are probably a little darker and grimmer um, and maybe a little bloodier. So, uh, and not nearly as funny. Uh, so Maria would like to, Maria says, I loved the Spy Coast. When is the sequel coming out? And I think uh, the name of the second book is, uh, so the series is The Martini Club. And the name of the second book is The Summer Guests. Is that correct, yes. Tess? And do yes, we have a release date for yet? It's scheduled for 2025, early 2025. Yeah. I'm a slow writer, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you also touched on this one, and I don't mean to annoy you because you probably get this question every single time you do something uh, like this. Uh, but uh, where are we with the uh, Rizzoli and Isles uh, series? Is it officially over? And if there is another book coming, uh, any idea when? Okay, um, no, it's not officially over. I have to, I have to turn in this next book for Maggie Bird, and after that, um, there's a particular character in the Rizzoli and Isles universe that I really really love to kill, and I think I think I think she's <laughs> going down. 
And that's going to be the, <laughs> going to be the number one. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't thought about my own series that way. Is there somebody I really want to kill? Okay. That's that, you know, that might, that might you might Only be way. the genesis of the next one. Well, the, Paul, uh, speaking of your series, uh, lots of questions on uh, the next uh, Mike uh, Bowditch book. Uh, any idea when that might be coming? I do. It's um, It actually was formally accepted by my editor today. It will be out on the last Tuesday of June, June uh, 25th, uh, 2024. It's called Pitch Dark. And it... Uh, it takes place, if you know Maine at all, the town of Jackman, which is sort of the last town you hit before you cross into Quebec. And um, I wanted to write a, a, a border book and and bring Mike right up to the edge of, oh my God, do I cross over here? Do I chase this guy or not? And I'll leave it to people's imaginations what Mike Bowditch would do in that situation. <laughs> Uh, so a couple of final questions here. Uh, Judy asks, uh, for both of you, what is your approach to incorporating factual material into your novels? Um, I just want it to be possible. You know, I don't want it to go against the facts. That's all. I mean, if I'll use the facts when I can, but if the facts don't exist, then I'll make them up. <laughs> they just have to be possible. I think that that's, that is the same for me. I mean, I, I love doing the research, you know, don't get me wrong. And, and it's, it's a great excuse to learn about how they find a body underwater, you know, to write, <laughs> write a novel in which that's the central uh, problem. Right. Um, but on the other hand, the, the logistics of a lot of, of law enforcement and, and, and medicine, God knows, um, uh, you know, you really can't, it, it doesn't lend itself to, clear storytelling there's lots of it's complicated there's jargon it's you know you have to you really do have to sort of strip away a lot of the the things that that you know the real aficionados care about in order to tell a, a, a compelling story that that moves right along let's see here uh this is sort of a fun question uh from eileen uh, for both of you, uh, do you get to select the narrators of your audiobooks? Um, I, I get audio clips, um, samples from each of the possibilities, and then I will choose. Uh, what a life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was, I always joke that, uh, people always, they said, they say, why don't you narrate your own books? And I'm like, I'm glad I don't narrate my own books. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I'm not an actor and I can't do all the voices and that sort of thing. Uh, but I, I did get very lucky in having uh, um, uh, a series narrator who I did, had no business, no involvement in choosing, but who, who has, who's very talented. He's named Henry Leva and he's, uh, he's very popular um, among my listeners. They, they really feel like he he nails Mike and and uh, and gets a lot of the other characters as well. So, um, you know, but sometimes, yeah, some of these decisions, are just, you know, it's I, I I don't mind that I, I didn't get to pick him. <laughs> uh, so, folks, uh, we are going to start to wind down. Um, just a reminder for those who are watching live: uh, look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to this recording a link to a feedback survey and information on where you can purchase copies of Tess and Paul's uh, latest books. Uh, additionally, I will formally thank all 50 participating libraries uh, in that email. Uh, but before we go for the evening, I wanted to turn it back over to Paul and Tess. Uh, did you folks have any last words for the audience? I, well, um, yeah, I do. I want to thank everybody for for, for tuning in um, tonight. It's really, this is really a neat initiative to to get all these libraries together and yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm so grateful to to be part of this and thank you Tess for asking me to be um involved um I'm wondering if you've if if you are now that winter is looming are you still going up Mount Batty oh I try to I try to every day uh, <laughs> as long as it's not raining or icy and I just I just want to thank readers for for buying our books and, and <laughs> allowing us to indulge in this crazy occupation we have <laughs> yeah absolutely it's... great well folks let's give uh paul and tess one more big virtual round of applause for being with us tonight 
And uh, don't forget uh, to purchase a copy of Dead Man's Wake and uh, The Spy Coast uh, at uh, from your uh, favorite local independent bookstore. Uh, so thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks again, Tess. Thanks again, Paul. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Yes.